One of the defining characteristics of the late 18th century, early 19th century art was a renewed interest in classical antiquity, or as we learned in a previous lecture, classical revival. This was reviving not only the aesthetics of the art of the classical past, that of ancient Greece and Rome, but it's also reviving the culture as well. And what we see here, the statue of Napoleon is a great example of this classical revivalism, where Napoleon, he's this powerful political figure of 19th century France, but he's shown to us in the guise of the Roman war god Mars, complete with the classical heroicizing and idealizing nudity and the carefully measured contrapposto stance that really is a page out of the playbook of classical period Greek sculptors of the fifth century. The popularity of turning back to the classical past was popular and it was wide ranging. But here in this lecture, we're only going to be focusing on one of two parts of what's a much broader picture. So in this lecture, we've got the neoclassical or new classical style in France. And then our companion lecture, which comes next, is neoclassicism in America. Now for both French and American neoclassicism, an important part of this context to keep in mind was the growing authority of the Enlightenment, which was essentially a new school of thought that encouraged one to think critically about the world around them, really prioritizing education and empirical knowledge while setting aside myth, tradition, and religion. So for example, think back to the French King Louis XIV, who argued that he ruled by divine right, that it was God's preference. And with Enlightenment thought, there is this pushback of, here's a wild idea. How about instead of using religion to justify political power, how about we separate religion and politics and people actually get to choose who represented them? And that people, not just the most uh, upper echelon of rich people, would maybe get a chance to actually participate in the political system that governed them. Or think back to the Rococo style, which shone a spotlight on all these very rich people behaving badly, while the rest of France worked themselves to the bone and still had trouble making ends meet. The justification of this was, well, you know, this is the way it's always been, this profound division between the rich and the poor. And with Enlightenment thought, again, you know, there's this pushback and, hey, here's a wild idea. How about we let go of tradition? How about we do something different than what's just always been done and work towards more of an equilibrium in the economic system? So when you think about these examples that I've provided, you can see why it's really no coincidence that Enlightenment thought is the backdrop from which revolution emerges, both in France and in America. Now Jacques-Louis de Vigne, he was one of the, if not the leading French neoclassical painters. And his career is really interesting because it spans the entire arc of the revolution. He's painting for the pre-revolution while uh, painting for the King of France. He paints for the revolution, you know, painting for the cause. And then in the post-revolution, he paints for Napoleon. Now, before we get into the context of this painting, let's first talk about the style of French neoclassical painting. And this is such a great example because it really represents this artistic approach very well. Now, again, what we want to keep in mind is that the neoclassical style is connected to classical reviving, reviving the classical past. Now, in this painting, the subject itself is classical. It's rooted in ancient Rome, and it's depicting an event that was described by the Roman historian Livy. Now, what David has created here is an imaginative reinvention of the real life 7th century BCE conflict between Rome and a rival territory, Alba. The decision was to solve their issues 
Each side would fight it out by sending three representatives. And wouldn't you know it, but for Rome, these representatives just happened to be three brothers from the Horatius family. Hence the title of the name, or hence the name of the title. So here we see them setting out to fight. And they're framed within a classical interior space where you have an arcade, a row of arches, you've got Tuscan columns. You see that they're dressed in the classical dress of Roman soldiers. And even their bodies look like this painted version of Greek and Roman sculpture with all these defined muscles. I mean, seriously, we cannot get more classical than what we've got going on here. Now, we can see that there's some drama here. And this drama is typical of neoclassicism. Now, I wouldn't go so far to say that this is the same level of drama that we saw with the Italian Baroque style in Caravaggio, but there is drama. And I want you, when you think about this idea of drama, to actually think about this literally. Think of a stage. We have this shallow stage-like setting where you've got the action up at the front and center with this shallow space behind where you really can't see back into the depth of the space. And this is really just how theatrical dramas are actually acted out. We even have this dramatic lighting that kind of has this sort of almost artificial spotlight effect. And both of these, I'll sell three of these, the drama, the visual drama, the shallow space, the spotlight. These are all typical of the French neoclassical style. Now, another common feature is brushwork. It's very crisp, it's very tight, it's very detailed, and it helps to create these very carefully constructed compositions. Now, let's apply these stylistic features to the context. This painting was commissioned by Louis XVI, who was the King of France. Now, he sensed that he was not the most popular guy in France, and he was right. We want to take a look at the date here, 1784 to 1785. This is right on the doorstep of the revolution, which occurs in 1789. So the king had David make this painting with a moral message. And this is another pretty typical feature of the neoclassical style, this idea of like lofty subject matter that inspires the viewer. And you can see the moral messaging here as clear as day. We've got three brothers swearing on swords being held by their father as they go off to fight for Rome. So the king envisioned it as this idea of paying honor to your father and being obedient, where the king is the father and the French people are the sons. And this idea of going along with the father and in doing so, it's an act of patriotism. You know, this really is propaganda at its finest. And people totally got the message to be noble, to be patriotic, to fight for a righteous cause. But the problem is that they saw these ideas as fuel to fight for the France they believed in. And that was not a France that was controlled by an ineffective monarchy and a frivolous upper class. So Louis XVI had hoped that this would kind of quell or calm down the revolutionary sentiments that were growing in France, but this painting had the reverse effect and it actually increased them. So Louis XVI does fall and the revolution does break out and David takes up the cause and begins painting in affiliation with the Jacobians, who are a pretty radical revolutionary group. And this is an image during this part of David's career that brings attention to the assassination of the revolutionary Jean-Paul Marat, who was a personal friend of David. Now the story goes as follows. So Marat was soaking in a tub to ease the discomfort of a skin ailment that he suffered from when a knock on the door comes. And his butler, door answerer guy, opens the door to a woman named Charlotte Corday, who was a counter-revolutionary. And she had a letter for Marat, and she asked to speak to him. 
and Marat accepts, which is an interesting choice to take a meeting while naked in the tub, but maybe that's just me. And so you can see, if you look at the painting, the letters in his hand, you can see Charlotte Corday written on the letter. And uh, she comes in to meet him. And when she does show, so she stabs him. And here we see the aftermath. He is blood out. You can see the stab wound just under his um, clavicle on his chest. He's dead. So struck down while in the process of working, pen in hand, creating the revolutionary writings that he was so well known for. So let's talk about what's neoclassical about this image, because this isn't as obvious as the previous painting where we have classical history and architecture and clothing. Now we do have that shallow stage-like space and the spotlight lighting that creates that sense of drama within this piece. And I love it because it's so dramatic, but yet there's something that's so quiet and still about it, which really is appropriate when we're thinking about death. We also have that controlled, crisp brushwork, which is very different from the, the sumptuousness of that more feathery, looser Rococo approach. Instead, that conveys that crisp, tight stroke, more of a sense of seriousness and discipline. And what's also neoclassical about this image is we have moralizing subject matter. Again, this idea of patriotism, but this is to the max where Marat died for the cause. And you have that, that with that spotlight light, it takes on this almost symbolic quality. It's like God himself, right? God's taking time out of his busy God schedule to shine this light down personally on this fallen man who is so moral and so dedicated to such a sacred cause. And if you really want to convey to someone that somebody has died for a sacred cause, that they are a martyr, what is the best way to do this? To, the best way to do this is to equate them with the ultimate martyr, Jesus. If you look at the position of Marat's arm, you can see that it's quite similar to that of Jesus in Michelangelo's very famous Pietà. And this is something that classicizes David's painting. He's drawing from a classical revival image because remember, the Renaissance also was a classical revivalist style. It too was all about reviving classical Greece and Rome. Now, another way that David generated sympathy for Marat was by idealizing his face. You can see, no offense to Marat, he wasn't like the most handsome guy out there. His face is very angular. And um, if you do like a Google search of Marat portraits, you can see that they, they look very similar to the one we see here. Uh, very angular and his face has this asymmetry to it. And so what David does is he, he softens up the face a little bit, um, kind of making him look a little more handsome to win over the viewer all the more. So David's revolutionary activities, they get him in a lot of trouble. And in fact, he almost gets killed for it. So it really was an uphill battle for him to rehabilitate his artistic career after that. And that made it pretty hard for him to say no when Napoleon, who was taking control of France, asked David to be his personal painter. Now, this image is a testament to how Napoleon was able to come to power to become an emperor over a polity that had recently deposed a king, and that is through military might and prowess. Here we have a typical neoclassical painting in its emotional drama. You've got Napoleon in full military regalia, charging up the side of a mountain on a giant horse, one hand's in the air, his cape is billowing in the wind behind him. And you've got that shallow space with that limited background to really ensure that our focus is kept on this majestic figure. So I want to point out this image is actually not the most innovative. This is something that we've seen before. This image is taken from equestrian portraits of ancient Rome. 
And that's what makes this image in part neoclassical. Now, David doesn't just draw from any old Roman equestrian portrait, but one example, Marcus Aurelius, okay, who pretty much was the bossest emperor in the history of the Roman Empire. You can see the similarities. Both Napoleon and Marcus Aurelius, they have their size amplified so that it rivals the size of a full-grown horse. These men are not riding mini ponies like little Sebastian. They're riding full-size horses. It's just that their physical prominence is such that it rivals the size of these powerful animals. And it's like both of these men control their steeds through a sheer force of will. Neither of them are like holding on barely at all. Um, and then even just are riding one-handed with the other arm extended up as they lead their followers. Now these similarities were intended to link Napoleon to someone as illustrious as Marcus Aurelius. As if to say that Napoleon is the next in line in terms of strong political and military leaders. But I am sorry, nobody is the next Marcus Aurelius. That guy is completely unrivaled. Now this argument that Napoleon is trying to align himself within this lineage of strong leaders as a way to justify his power is further supported. If you look at the bottom of the Napoleon portrait, on the bottom left, you're going to see that there are names inscribed into the stone. You've got Hannibal, who was a renowned Roman general, and you also have Carolus Magnus, aka Charlemagne, who was pretty much the superstar of the Middle Ages. And then look at this. Here's Napoleon's name right alongside such testaments to greatness. And I think, you know, here's a little fun fact about uh, the dramatic flair of this piece with, you know, this horse and all of that. Uh, this was a little uh, fudging on the part of David because in actuality, when um, Napoleon was crossing the Alps, he was riding on a mule, not a horse. Now, before we transition from French neoclassical painting to architecture, I want to move away from the revolution to just look at something else that came out of neoclassicism. And here we're looking at the work of Benoit, who was a student of Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, who we looked at in a previous lecture. She was, uh, Le Brun was the favorite painter of Queen Marie Antoinette. Benoit also was a student of Jacques-Louis David, so she had some really impressive training, and that's something that I think is pretty evident in the top-notch quality of her work. Like the equestrian portrait of Napoleon, what makes this work quote-unquote neoclassical isn't immediately clear. A deeper explanation or examination is needed. So, what we're looking at is we're looking at a contemporary take on the reclining female nude. You've got the drapery and it's classicizing. And you could even make the argument perhaps, and I'm sure you know you can go either way, some would agree, some would disagree, but I think you could make the argument that maybe even that nudity is classicizing as well. Although it does uh, warrant mention that in the context of 19th century France, this public display of a bared breast, this would not go very well. It did not go very well in the social and with the social and cultural mores of the time. What, what was going on was, what you have in this painting is you have an intersection of gender and race. And this made people uncomfortable, and it definitely made this a controversial artwork for sure. In terms of gender, you have this assertive female subject. She's sitting up with assertive posture, strong. She's looking directly and unapologetically at the viewer. It's in this way that's almost defiant, considering that nudity wasn't something that was acceptable for a quote-unquote proper lady. And, you know, with the simplicity of the background, right, which is typical neoclassicism, you've got, you know, a lack of depth, the focus stays on the, the subject. 
this really assures that she commands and sustains the attention of the viewer. So in a way, it gives her a lot of power, which would also make somebody pretty uncomfortable during this time. Now, in terms of race, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised to hear me say that, you know, a respectable depiction of an African woman wasn't a common subject during um, this time in this place. And that is true, but there's more to it than this, the timing. So in 1794, France had abolished slavery. But at the time when this painting was made, Napoleon was considering reinstituting slavery because France had lost all this revenue when their colonies were unable to use slave labor. So it was an economic decision and actually slavery was reinstituted in the French colonies in 1802. Now the detailed nature of this painting and um, the fact that Bensois was really a highly accomplished portraitist suggests that this is an image of an actual person. This isn't just like a figment of her imagination. So a real person. And considering the context I've just outlined, you know, this may be an attempt to humanize the people who others were considering re-enslaving. There's something else here to consider. There is this art historical tradition surrounding the single bared breast and what that tradition is, is it was often used with allegorical figures. An allegory is a personification of a certain concept. And in this case, she may be an allegory of France because notice the blue um, on that drapery behind her chair, the white of her garment, the red of her sash. That blue, white, and red is the same colors of the French tricolor flag. Now this would certainly resonate with the audience because the tricolored flag was new. It was something that was adopted during the French Revolution. And here's a fun fact, it was actually designed by David. And why was that revolution being why was that revolution being fought for freedom? So this makes a powerful statement on freedom. Now Benoit never discussed her motivations behind creating this powerful painting. So until other evidence comes to light, we can never truly really know what her intent was. So let's move on now to French neoclassical architecture. The same thing can be said for architecture, which is said for painting. The intent is to revive the classical aesthetic. Here's a great example. We have the French neoclassical La Madeleine, which is basically a re-articulation of the Greek Parthenon in Athens. In both, we have the geometric perfection. You have this rectangle plan that features a colonnade, a row of columns that runs all around the exterior. You've got your triangle roof, the pediment, which sits on top with sculpture, as well as with sculpture in the frieze. Now, the Parthenon was a temple dedicated to a Athens' patron deity, Athena, who not coincidentally was also associated with war. And for our Paris example, this structure was conceived of also as a temple. In this case, Napoleon's temple to glory. 1807 was when, ne when Napoleon was at the height of his power. And again, this is a power that's very much characterized by military prowess. So it's interesting to me that this structure was connected to the concept of a religious temple, yet it was a monument to secular military triumph. This seems to underline well this idea of secularism, of moving, moving away from religion that was part of the Enlightenment climate at the time. Napoleon's Temple of Glory reminds us that traditionally, there's been a political component embedded within neoclassicism, where the ideas and the aesthetics are used to promote greatness, authority, and morality with an agenda. And uh, it's not something that just Louis XVI was doing with his oath of the Horatii. 
Even recall back to the Renaissance, where popes like Julius II were associating themselves with classicism as a means to demonstrate their intelligence and culture, both of which are an indirect representation of wealth. Finally, there's another aspect to the Parthenon's biography that suggests that it's a choice to serve as the inspiration for La Madeleine and that this is not just a coincidence. The Parthenon also had connections to military victory as it was built to celebrate the Greeks' triumphs over the Persians. So the Parthenon altogether represented a history embedded with military strength, victory, high culture, intellectualism, heroism, and that makes for a fitting context for Napoleon's own temple to military glory. And here's another great example of French neoclassical architecture, Paris's Arc de Triomphe, which is directly based off of the tradition of the Roman triumphal arch. Now the triumphal arch was a uniquely Roman architectural form and it began to appear in the empire around the second century BCE. And it was continued to be built all the way through to the fall of the empire. So this type of structure, the triumphal arch, was very much synonymous with Rome. The triumphal arch, as the name suggests, was associated with triumph, oftentimes military. These arches also in addition to functioning as a commemorative monument, would sometimes serve as a gateway where they were placed at the entry point of cities that were conquered by the Romans. Comparing the arch commissioned by Napoleon to, for example, the one associated with Trajan is appropriate because Trajan was a very successful military leader as well as an emperor. And this really was what was made him actually so successful as an emperor was through his military exploits, he brought a lot of wealth and a lot of territory to the empire. We see that both our Roman and French examples contain a, a similar form, but Napoleon's arch was next level. It was the largest arch ever built at 164 feet high. We can see that both exhibit relief sculptures. However, the ones on the Parisian arch um, were added after the 1830 revolution. So this was after Napoleon was gone and he was exiled in 1815. The Arc de Triomphe was one of a series of structures, just like La Madeleine from the previous slide, that Napoleon built as part of this really ambitious public works project that he undertook after being crowned Emperor of France in 1804. Construction for the Arc de Triomphe began in 1806, to be exact, on August 15th, which just happened to be Napoleon's birthday, which certainly is not a coincidence. The idea behind the arch was to bring the grandeur of ancient Rome, which had been the largest empire in the West, and certainly the most powerful and infamous, bring that to Paris, to suggest that Rome was be reborn once again with Napoleon next in line after the illustrious Trajan and Marcus Aurelius.